Upstairs at Freilich Show 120, Real One. Quite a twist, huh? Bet you didn't see that one coming. So next up on Upstairs with Frelix, we are doing two forgotten Ralph Bakshi films. We are doing 1975-1982's Hey Good Looking and 1992's Cool World. Hey, good looking. What you got cooking? You know, when I expected to hear that song in the movie, I got so <laughs> short fucking changed when I didn't hear it. Okay. Um, we're, we're a little divided on these, aren't we? We're, uh... Oh, dude, this is, this is, I am dubbing this. This is the Siskel and Ebert episode <clears throat> that you've been waiting for. Because we are going to have some major disagreements tonight. So I'm going to be able to do my Dan Aykroyd and go, John, you ignorant slut. <laughs> um, so, Hey, Good Looking is, it came out, the movie actually came out in 1982. It was uh, made, uh, started to be made in 1974 or even earlier. Because, you know, these things take a really long time to make. These, well, back then, these animated movies, because this was all freaking handmade. I was showing um, Regan uh, some animation cells of hey good looking i was you know basically you have to animate on pieces of plastic put those pieces of plastic photograph them reduce them to the 35 millimeter film frame you have to put them in one at a time it's all no computers back then it was all i mean this was truly a passion and bakshi is is one of the more was one of the more passionate animators and he was known mainly for fritz the cat which was a movie that cost uh i believe seven hundred thousand dollars to make because it was you know cost a lot of money to do animation Made ninety million dollars at the box office. It was an enormous hit for its time. A big hit for that time, which was like what the late sixties. This is where the agreements and disagreements come in. So first of all, I'm going to say, you think Ralph Bakshi is a great animator? I'm not going to deny that. But like I say, how Phil Spector is associated with his wall of sound, I will say that Ralph Bakshi is synonymous with the term rotoscoping because he is the king of rotoscoping. Well, yeah, he he was the he, one who. He's like the guy. You think of rotoscoping, you think of Ralph Bakshi. Now, I am not against that style of animation in any way, shape, and form. I just think he overuses it way too fucking much in a lot of his movies. Some of it is done to good effect. Some of it is done to horrible effect. And hey, good looking, too much fucking rotoscoping. And it's rotoscoping I can't fucking stand. That was one of my I, big I, complaints with the rotoscoping. I, you know, the animation in this movie did not did not irritate me nearly as much as Cool World for some reason because Cool World is is like a it's almost a headache on the eyes at least it was for me. It it is, but I mean, but back to this. So the reason that the animation is kind of rough in a lot of spots for the production history of this film. So this movie was supposed to come out in 1975. It was finished. Warner Brothers does have a finished print of this film in their archive that they will not let out. Right. The whole reason this movie, Warner Brothers actually loved it. They said, oh, my God, this is a great movie. We can't wait to release it. But then Coonskin happened. Right. Coonskin, uh, w th that was considered, uh, what, offensive, I guess? I get what Bakshi was trying to do with Coonskin, okay? But nobody else did back in the 70s. That movie was being picketed, for Christ's sake, because it was horribly racist, they didn't understand that it was an animation exploitation film, and the reason why they got why they got wet feet with it, it wasn't because of the subject matter. It was because of the fact that it was animation rotoscoped with live action, and because the movie flopped, Warner Brothers got cold feet. They got such cold feet, they're like, well, you know what? We're not going to release this right now. Come back to us next year, and maybe we'll do it again. Well, then yeah, ba Bakshi is not, he was not this kind of safe filmmaker. He was, he was political. Fritz the Cat and Heavy Traffic were very political movies. Coonskin I don't know much about. But you know, you have a you have a black ra rabbit fox and a bear rise at the top of the organized crime racket in Harlem. Yeah, actually Philip Michael Thomas is in this movie and he's in Coonskin as well. Yep. And he was Tubbs on on um, Miami, Miami Vice. Vice. You know, whatever it is and also Bryanston distributed yeah, but I Coonskin. think I don't think it, I don't think it's the Texas Chainsaw. I don't think it's uh, I think it's the Chainsaw Bryanston and not the Deep Throat Bryanston. Remember, history has always been sketchy on this one. There's two different Bryanstons out there. At least that's what history wants you to believe. But yeah, mm -hmm. Bryanston did the original Coonskin because like uh, Paramount was supposed to release it, and right. they got cold feet, and they literally signed the rights over to Bryanston to release it, and it barely got released. 
So we even had in 1975, we had people uh, picketing and protesting movies, probably because of exaggerated racial stereotypes. That's that's what I'm going to guess. And probably more than frequent use of the word, uh, the N-word. Yeah, the N-word. <laughs> Which we did when we were watching Django Unchained, uh, me and Brown were trying to do an N-word count. We kind of gave up about 30 minutes into it. That's a drinking game you don't want to play, by the way. <clears throat> the, thing, the thing about it is... Uh, uh, I, I think people need to develop a sense of humor. That's probably the best thing for them to I th- do. I think the heat that this movie got was the same heat that Tarantino got. A white man should not make a movie with that type of subject matter because they don't know what it's about because they're white. Well, as, as far as I can tell from Bakshi's career, he's kind of a journeyman. He comes up with a project, and he takes it to a studio, the studio finances it, and then he does it. He never works with the same studio twice. I've noticed this. He does, uh, after, after Coonskin came out, he did Wizards, for one that was company, for Fox. Lord of the Rings. For Warner Brothers. Uh, and American Pop. Which for is, Columbia. Yeah. And uh, we were talking about American Pop, uh, and you were asking why it, it wasn't as popular as it should have been. And that was, this was during a time when Columbia Pictures was buying up all these properties. They started buying properties between 1978 and 1982, around the, in the time period that the movie was released. So when you buy suddenly you become bankrupt it's like the donald trump method of buying things where you say all right i'm going to give you 50 million dollars for this okay i have no money now now i'm bankrupt you know something like that and uh and then coca-cola and of course all that so this uh he he kind of uh, american pop should have been a bigger movie and it's probably his best movie out of it everything. is it is his best at movie. least his most accessible for our generation fritz the cats was was enormously popular it got really good reviews and every everybody saw it's funny because when you look at reviews for his later movies everybody keeps comparing it to fritz fritz the cat they compare a good look into fritz the cat and then when you get to like cool world in 92 it's kind of like a watered down back sheet that has had his that's been castrated basically well there's more to that but we'll move on to that when we get on to that trust me there's more to that but um with this movie i said to you that I think it's a 30-page screenplay heavily fucking padded to make a 150-page screenplay because there is just... This is Ralph, no pun intended for the prior Tarantino-isms that we did, but this is Ralph Bakshi Unchained because I, I, as a person who's seen every Ralph Bakshi movie, you have your Ralph Bakshi that's working within the confines of the studio system, then you have your Ralph Bakshi that just goes batshit crazy and just throws paint on the fucking canvas and lets it run. He does. He does go a little bit over that. Well, it, it's mainly, I think, the character uh, of of these uh, the, these characters are very exaggerated. They're very big, and everything they do is like this big animated thing. So whatever. They're, it's not like they're. It's not like like filmation from from back in the early '70s with television cartoons where they're just standing still and their mouths are moving. You know that kind of thing. My big problem with this movie: the opening scene with the trash can and the garbage. What form of exposition was that? What the fuck did that have anything to do with it being in this movie? Because it literally made no sense. It was just there to fucking be there. It had no reason to be it there. Was, it was a trash can talking to a pile of garbage. And then it the had... garbage being hauled off by a garbage truck. And they were having some kind of a weird comment. And it's like, I don't know. Maybe he had that in the back of his head. Maybe he dropped acid and said, hey, man, we should have garbage cans talking to garbage. You know, something like that. Oh, I swear. That's when we're out, when Ralph Bakshi goes fucking off the rails, man. It's either a, it's either a great thing or it's a fucking train wreck. In this case, it's a fucking train wreck. I don't know that I agree. I, I'll give you my my summation of the story here. The uh, the movie starts when a strange man tosses a fragment of a black leather jacket to an overweight older woman, and then we go back to Brooklyn in the 1950s. I'm guessing, and the story of Vinny and Crazy Shapiro, members of the Stomper Street Gang. As they rumble, they have their exploits, and they try to get laid. Uh, Vinny has eyes for the voluptuous young Rosie. As with most animation from the time, the backgrounds are static, like oil paintings, yep. with these highly energetic foreground characters dancing and singing. The women are shapely, and the men are big and muscular. Vinny gets into a hassle with a black gang called the Chaplains, and they agree to a rumble. Uh, that's where Philip Michael Thomas comes in. He plays a couple of the characters in the Chaplains. And it becomes tragic in short order. Crazy Shapiro shoots a guy. You know, I mean, it's like he really is crazy because he has no idea. He has no moral compass or anything. He thinks everything is fun and everything is a joke. So he's kind of a sociopath, which is a little disturbing. And I wanted to make note of the fact that Richard Romanus and David Proval yeah. provide the voices of Vinny and Shapiro. And they were both in Martin Scorsese's Mean Streets. The dialogue and situations are not politically correct. 
Uh, now, the 1982 version of the movie is a revised draft of the original movie made in 1974, wherein Bakshi wanted to incorporate his animated characters into an actual live background. But apparently they couldn't really do that at the time. He does get his wish with Cool World. That's that's really what he wanted to do. I think that's what, that's what got him interested, because I don't think Cool World was his project. I think it was brought to him. It was brought to him. Now, here's the thing. What and he probably is, said, wait a minute, if I can do my if I can do my live action background, can we do this movie? And they said, yeah. So he agreed to do it. Right. Right. Now, here's the thing. You could do live action and animation back then. You could. If you were Disney. I guess. Yeah. He, he, uh, Mary, he Pop, worked. Mary Poppins, bed knobs and broomsticks. Well, Enough yeah. Set. Yeah. Enough said. Point is, you had to have Disney money to do that kind of shit. And he worked out of like what? A loft in Tribeca or something. He worked. He was just a guy and a couple of animators. He wasn't like the factory that Disney was. I mean, and you see the scenes in this movie where there where there is some animation mixed in with the live action. It they're terrible. They're beyond terrible. It's well, yeah, it you know, I the the recording that I looked at was not of the best quality. So, it's really hard to tell what a very good it's only available as a warner archive title yeah. on dvd it's not even available on blu-ray so but, for our listening audience we will come out there and say yes we watched this movie on youtube because we're both a bunch of cheapskates <laughs> and we and we don't want to order a fucking burn dvd of this movie when we'd rather have like a blu-ray or something like that plus okay? you really get the sense that all of it is done in pieces too uh, the the recording quality of the dialogue you, you noticed how inconsistent it was yeah, very inconsistent it, uh, some some scenes sound like they were recorded in a bathroom. Other scenes sound like they were recorded in a gymnasium. So it's it's it get it's a little jarring because there is no through line of of uh, a good quality sound throughout the whole thing. And he uh, had put like a bunch of of uh, he has like a big record collection, so he needle dropped a whole bunch of his own music from his collection that he wanted to put in the movie, but the Warner Brothers didn't have the money or the time or whatever to pay now, for the that's, rights. And that's one of the aspects of this movie I didn't like because we're talking about a 1950s period piece. Why are you using like this modern music in a 1950s? This modern music, it sounds very 80s. It's very 80s sounding, but it, it's trying to evoke a period of the 50s. But what it does for me, because I was, I was neither born in the 80s or the 70s, or, or the 50s. I was born in the 70s. Looking at it, it kind of it made me nostalgic for the 80s watching it. Yes. So you know how I, I, I'm sure we've had this conversation before. There was a fascination in the 80s with the 50s. We've seen it in a few movies, Back to the Future, Streets of Fire, things like that, right? Well, you also had Happy Days. And I mean, Happy Days. granted, Happy Days was, was a 70s show, but it carried on into the 80s. So there was an obvious nostalgia because all these people were, were entering middle age at the time. And they were going back to their time as as a uh, youth or something, but I doubt Bakshi was ever in a gang. <laughs> he doesn't strike no, me as a kind of no, no way, no. He was he was dropping acid with Andy Warhol for all. He was fucking... dropping acid. He was smoking weed, and he was just getting laid. In oh, in... and he was hanging out with Robert Crumb. <laughs> you know, and so I found that distracting. But the thing is, I found Hey Good Looking to be honest storytelling in cartoon form. It it was just it's a cartoon for adults. It's not very long either. It's an hour and seventeen. I mean, it kind of went by very quickly for me. I mean, it's a very short movie, but the but my whole problem is I think it would have worked better as a short film, because again, I like Bakshi when he's being his most creative. And here, uh, I don't know how creative he's being. I think he's he's being derivative of him, of himself because he just wanted to get this project finished. So, like I said, he just threw the paint at the well, yeah, you're canvas spending and let it run. That much fucking time on a movie. Um, it's gonna drive you crazy. And I don't. And I fun. honestly don't think that he would have gotten it finished if not for American Pop, because yeah, I think Warner Brothers were looking at what he had done. He had now we he had four movies. He had Wizards, uh, Lord of the Rings, Fire and Ice, and American Pop. I think after Warner Brothers looked at those movies and looked at how well they performed, they at least made their money back. People were seeing them like, okay, you know what? We'll let you finish your movie, but under this one condition, you have to animate it. You can't do the live action shit. And I guess he said, fuck it. I agree. And I wanted okay. to get it done. Well, we've never done two Meridian meters for an episode. We've only done one for a movie that we both agreed that was horrible. So I'm going to give you a shot at the Meridian meter for Hey, Good Looking. Okay. Only because I like Bakshi. Okay. I'm going to give it a four. All right. It gets a four on Freilich's Meridian meter. Uh, just as an afterthought, for me, I would probably give it um, I'm going to give it a seven. <laughs> All righty. All right, so let's move on to Cool World. Ah, now this is where I get to have my fun. I fucking love this movie. And you know why? I was obsessed with it. I was so obsessed with this movie. 
I saw the trailers for it on TV back in the 90s. I had just seen Roger Rabbit, and this movie just looked like this cool live action with animation movie. And I'm like, oh, my God, Mom and Dad, you have to take me to see it. And did they take me? Fuck no. Ugh, I had to wait for VHS. All right. Can I, can I, can I say something? Go ahead. John, you ignorant slut. <laughs> this movie is a mess. It's a jumble of animation and live action, the delineation of cartoon and real worlds, like Who Framed Roger Rabbit with, with, with Brow Bakshi's fascination for his own images and PG-13 safe sexuality. All right, now go drink your fucking Crystal Skull vodka, okay? <laughs> Whatever. It's, it's really good vodka. It's I really know. good. There are no impurities in it. None at all. There's no. Uh, there's none of that. Uh, what is that? Radiator fluid they put in there. Yeah. I <laughs> uh, now I watched this with Bronwyn too because she loves Gabriel Byrne. Even though she did confess to me later, she's seen Byrne and everything. She said he didn't seem right for the part. He was not. I can he, even agree. Yeah. To, on 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 a most recent viewing, I will agree he was not right for the part. Although he it, does pull off his American accent very well. Well, I'll tell you that maybe maybe uh, maybe. We're looking at a neighbor's situation, and they should have switched parts. Perhaps Gabriel Byrne should have played the cop, and Brad Pitt should have played and the comic. Ironically parts. enough, that's who they wanted. They wanted Brad Pitt to be Jack Deeps, but then it's they felt they felt he wasn't right for the role, so they gave him the role of Jack Harris. Now this is this is at a time when Brad Pitt was practically a nobody. He had only been in a couple of movies. Cutting he was class, in, Johnny Swade. Right, and yeah, Johnny Swade, Tom DiCio, right? Yep. And then he would get his big break a year later with uh, Thelma and Louise, right? Yep, and then Which, right after that... Starring me... Gina Davis. It all comes yep. back to Gina Davis. Yeah, so we're going to play Six Degrees of Gina Davis now. So. Six Degrees, yeah. But after that, it came full circle. Legends of the Fall was like his next big break, and after that... Legends of the started. Fall is the movie that exploded Brad Pitt all over the place. Everybody fell in love. And during that time period, he also he did 12 Monkeys. He got an Oscar nomination for that role. He became this enormous fucking star. And 12 Monkeys is actually my favorite Brad Pitt performance of all time, just for a few simple lines. Get out of my chair! <laughs> <laughs> I, have, um, I actually have a Universal signature box set of 12 Monkeys on Laserdisc oh, so down do in I. the basement. Oh, you have that too. Oh, so do and I. You, so you saw the uh, the Hamster Factor documentary, which yep. is really cool. Great documentary. And it shows Brad Pitt is like one of these guys. Okay, I, I want to know everything. What it is to be mentally disturbed. Okay, so he has to talk to doctors, right? And these doctors, they they give him a little bit of information, and they, they, he's ready to leave. This doctor, he's like, okay, is that all you need? I'm gonna go now. He says, no, oh, no, tell me more, tell me more. <laughs> you know, it's like my problem my big problem with this movie is there's no focus to anything there's no story i feel like there was more of a story and hey good look and it was about a bunch of kids a bunch of it's, uh, bad shit happens blah 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 we're in the future credits roll you know there's a resolution but here i mean i feel like the, the, there's nothing gabriel byrne is a cartoonist i for some reason he's being released from prison they say killed his old lady no, 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 no. Yeah, you know it's like a blues lady. thing what he, what he ended up doing is he found his wife in bed with another man and then he Found killed, wife and he with killed the man. other guy and his wife. Killed the other guy. Dur, nur, 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 nur. You know, it's like a the thing. But he's like a cartoonist or something. He comes, he has a home apparently. I can't, you know. And then he's he's got a studio loaded with his. He's got a nice drawing table that he destroys. My wife almost cries when she sees that because she has a drawing table too. And um, there's this place called the Cool World, and he believes. I guess he believes he has created the Cool World, which is a world of cartoon imagery. And specifically the character of Hollywood, who is played by Kim Basinger. A belief is not enough reason for me to plunk down $5 for a movie ticket. You believe you created a cartoon world? No. If you did create the cartoon world, yes. Take my money right now. Right. And that, and that uh, but is we one start, of the But first, wait a minute. We, we start with Brad Pitt. And he's in, he's in, he has a motorcycle accident. He's like, he got a motorcycle. He got, he's got his mom on the motorcycle. I don't know. He crashes to a car. It's, it's, it's somebody died. There's somebody's got a spike. There's a doctor, bald head, small guy who has a spike and he's trying to create, what is he trying to do? Is he trying to create like a portal between the animated world and he, the real yeah, world? Yeah. He's, he's just trying to create a portal between the cool world and the real world. And okay. that's, that's, why? Oh, what the fuck was that? Um, that was me screaming, why? <laughs> That's what the spike does, and you're right. They don't. They don't ever fucking explain it. Yes, this movie goes off the rail. But dude, I was a kid, man. I was a kid when I saw this. I was a fucking ten year old kid. All right, and I still love this movie. It has. Well, I'll give you this. I'll give you this about Cool World. One thing I can say in its favor, there are different animation styles at work here. Uh, every character is animated differently, almost. And if you look at Hollywood, 
she's like she's dressed all slutty and everything, and she's very sexy Marilyn Monroe type thing. But she's animated like a Disney cartoon, she whereas is. everybody everybody else is kind of animated in a weird Looney Tunes fashion or something like that. Well, let me tell you the one inconsistency upon you know second viewing. I don't like the Kim Basinger. Okay, let me say this: Hollywood in the flesh and Hollywood in the animated style are completely different. Because that was one of my whole big issues with the movie. I like Hollywood when she's a cartoon, a doodle. Mm -hmm. Let me rephrase that right. When she's a doodle, but then when she becomes human, all of a sudden she's got this thick. She's got the Kim Basinger Southern accent. Yeah, yeah. that comes out in a lot of movies. And And Kim Basinger doesn't really have a body like that. Yeah, it just goes downhill. Well, that I mean, that's that's sort of, but that's how Bakshi draws his women. He draws them to be incredibly voluptuous and feminine looking, right? Right. These incredible figures with very narrow waists, but big tits and big ass and big eyes and stuff like that. I, I will give Bakshi no no woman could ever look like that in real life. I give Bakshi credit for the fact that I think that he actually drew a cartoon version of Kim Basinger, and he did not draw her completely over the top, at least in her first incarnation as Hollywood. When we get to the second incarnation at the end of the movie, yeah, okay, then she's a little overboard, bigger tits, bigger ass. Mm, Yeah. You know, because she does pretty much have Kim Basinger's body in that movie. And at the time, man, Kim Basinger, whew, I'm just telling you, man, damn. She looked, you know, I mean, Kim Basinger always looked like a Barbie doll to me. She always seemed to look like a Barbie. When I saw her, I mean, I, the first time I actually saw her in a movie, I think, at the time, would have been Batman. So I look at Vicki Vale, and I'm like, you're, you're, you're supposed to be some kind of, like, photographer. Uh, and, you know, you caught the eye of Bruce Wayne and everything, but you look like a fashion model. I mean, you don't look like a photographer, you know? Yeah, you're too good looking to be, in, to be shooting pictures. You should be part of those pictures. Yes, yes, yes. So, I mean, Brad Pitt is thrust into this world after this motorcycle accident that kills his mother. He becomes some kind of a cop or something, determined to keep real people separated from cartoon people because we know what happens. Hey, you gotta That's say the, it, no, you got to say it the right way. Noids do not have sex with doodles. Yes, yes, yes. That's, it's, it kind of it does remind me a little bit of Who Framed Roger Rabbit there. Uh, I mean, everyone tried capitalizing on that. Now, the whole thing with Bakshi in this movie— this is not a Ralph Bakshi movie, even though it's directed by Ralph Bakshi. Long story short, studio interference. This movie was recut. This is not what Ralph well, Bakshi yeah, originally yeah. intended. But we will never know what well, originally I mean, it was. This, we will never well, know. actually, from what I understand, what I remember back uh, reading about it a long time ago in Premiere Magazine, I think it was. Premiere is no longer a magazine anymore because there are no more movie magazines practically. But there was a whole history of the back. The, the history of the production, this script went around like crazy. Everybody wanted this script. It was, it was the most sought-after script of its time. And when all the actors were, everybody that, they, uh, everybody that they pursued read the script and immediately wanted to do this movie. Uh, Gabriel Byrne, Brad Pitt, Kim Basinger. She, she became their, their, uh, their uh, person who got this script around to a lot of people. She read that part, and she loved it, and she wanted it. Now, I have a feeling this script was a lot bigger, a lot longer, with more story in it, more backstory, something like that. You know, more exposition, at least some kind of an explanation for what's going on. Yes, and it seems like it was cut down. It seems like it was cut down canon style. I mean, as with Firewalker, the story appears to have been edited out of the movie so that we have nothing left but action sequences. So that's why it looks chaotic to me. Yeah, you know? I mean, it, it, the movie is, okay, this movie's not hey, good looking all over the place, but it's modern movie all over the place. It's like you... You're jumping from one scene to another without a lot of exposition. Has a lot and of I, I, I can understand your nitpickiness with that. I get it. But again, I'm coming off the kid who was 10 years old watching this movie. I loved it. I mean, I didn't care about exposition back then. I just wanted to see cartoons and real people interact with each other because I'm a 10 year old kid and I don't know any better. Well, 92, I was uh, about to be 20. So <laughs> it was a little bit different for me. Eh, when you're 10 years old, man, you don't know any better. Then, then when you get older and your tastes get more refined and you start, you know, reading more into films, then you can pick it apart. Now, in the case of Cool World, yeah, I picked it apart. But at the end of the day, I still like the movie. I'll still watch it over and over again. This is one of the few films I For have. Me, I still yeah. have my original VHS that I bought previously viewed from the video store back in 1993. I still have it. My main problem is there's no internal logic in the story. No, no, so, none whatsoever. It has to have some kind of ground rules in it for it for for me to at least at least follow it. You know, watching it, my God, I like, felt like why, I was like getting high. Is, uh, it's like watching is... Natural Born Killers. It's all visual stimulation, and you get a contact high watching it. 
why does uh, Jack Deebs all of a sudden start going doodle after he gets done pork in Hollywood? <laughs> never, they never explain it. Okay. Yeah. All, all she thinks she needs to do is get this spike because it's going to fix her. It's like, okay, yeah. what, how exactly is this? But she wanted to be real. For some reason during the movie, she wanted to be real. And then when she got to be real, she wanted to be a cartoon again. The spike, she was, the spike was supposed, she thought the spike was supposed to cure her and make her human again and end it. But it turned out the, the spike was actually just the plunger for the hole that separated the cool world and the real world. Hmm. Okay. So I have my meridian meter for this one. Okay. And I'm going to have to, you know, I said initially I was going to give it a six, but even after thinking about it, I'm going to have to drop my grade down to a five. So this gets a five on the old meridian meter for me. I'm going to still give it an eight because I still have a soft spot in my heart for this movie because it was just a movie I watched all the time when I was a kid. And I still like the movie to this day. And apparently a lot of other people do, too, because, like, you can only get you could at one point in time only get this movie through Warner Archive. They did have a DVD release through Paramount. Then Warner Brothers and Paramount did their deal and it was released through Warner Archive. But then now Warner Brothers isn't doing Paramount shit with Warner Archive anymore. So I think the movie's a lot harder to find these days. All right. Welcome to the show. We were talking in this episode about Ralph Bakshi movies. Hey, good looking in the cool world. And um, I this is one of the few examples I have of any kind of animation because I'm not really big on animation, animated stuff. I, I like some TV shows that were animated, of course. And growing up in the 80s and 90s, I was a big Simpsons fan and all that kind of stuff. I think I even watched the Flintstones and the Jetsons. Uh, this is Vampire Hunter D. It is, uh, this, this is a movie that came out in 1985, and it's a Japanese animation movie. Very, very popular, extremely influential. Uh, and also, it's for adults. It's not really for kids, because there is sex and violence throughout the There's whole... There's plenty of animes that aren't for kids. All right, thank you. Special guest voice from Regan. Can we see the back? As you can see, okay, I, now I, it says the first animated horror film for adults. Now, this this is obviously a bootleg. It's been printed. It's also got, I think it's called Video Comics there, which I've never even heard of. But this was something uh, I believe a friend of mine at the video store that I worked at gave or lent to me, and I never gave it back to her. So I'm sorry. Um, but in the year 12,090 AD, the Earth is plagued by vampires who rule over small pockets of civilization and a mockery of ancient feudal land baronies. Uh, this is an amazingly animated movie. It's fantastic. And <clears throat> but this tape. It, 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 it's obviously, like I said, a, a, a bootleg, but it has a barcode on it, which is so strange. Uh, also, the quality of it, it does not look like it was like dubbed off of a hundred different VCRs or a hundred generations of videotapes. It's a very good quality uh, find, and I intend to keep it forever and ever and ever. And I'll probably leave it to Regan and my well. Have a good night. I promise it's going to be freaking sold. Mm -hmm.